Good afternoon, everybody. This is Hemi Bahar from the IEA. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining uh, the webinar today uh, that we will be presenting our recent analysis about uh, tracking countries' ambitions uh, on the COP28 uh, triple link. Uh, you will see uh, uh, the analysis that uh, we uh, conducted over the past few months uh, and some of the key uh, results by technology and uh, regions. Um, but before we go into the details of the of the results, I would like to give the floor to uh, Paolo Frankel, who is the head of the Renewable Energy Division here at the IEA. He will do some opening uh, remarks and then we will then begin with the presentation. Paolo. So thank you, Amy. Um, indeed, a big welcome to everybody also from my part on this uh, um, uh, webinar today presenting our latest report. Um, I would like just to say a few words on uh, the objectives of this report and the context. The context is, of course, the historic decision uh, taken at COP to have an objective in terms of uh, tripling the renewable capacity by 2030 compared to 2022, which is line in line with the IEA net zero uh, scenario, with the uh, net zero scenarios of other institutions like IRENA. Um, and <clears throat> now, it is really time for policies to deliver and to identify and to bridge two gaps. One is the implementation gap and second is the ambition gap. And now let me be more precise. This report tries to answer four main questions. The first, how is renewable power capacity reflected in existing government commitments, first of all, in NDCs? in nationally determined contributions, but also in, in other forms of countries, announcements and plans, which we uh, collective call in this report, renewable capacity ambitions. Second, are countries on track to achieve their own goal, these, these ambitions? This, is the, this can lead to implementation gaps. Third, how these ambitions collectively measure against the world COP28 pledge to triple global capacity by 2030. This is the ambition gap. And four, what are the relevant policy priorities to address the gaps both in implementation and ambition? These are the four objectives. We do this uh, within the mandate from our ministers, from the IEA ministerials in 2024, giving the mandate to track to the IA to track many indicators of post COP, including the treating renewables um, capacity. We do this also in collaboration with the UNFCCC. And with that, and with no further ado, I go back the word to Hemi uh, to start the presentation uh, also with our other colleagues in the team. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paolo. Uh, and now uh, I will uh, start uh, uh, the presentation with a few general things, uh, and then my colleagues will jump into uh, into the slides, uh, uh, and we will try to make this uh, as dynamic as, as possible. If you have any questions uh, during the uh, presentation, you can write them in the question and answer box, so we will answer them either written or we'll go back to, the, to them at the end. Um, and uh, we will try to answer all of them. Uh, if the, there's no time, we will actually come back to you with an email, uh, try to answer uh, your question. Um, as Paolo mentioned, uh, it's very important that the countries reached uh, uh, an agreement in the stock take document of COP28 and included uh, several pledges, including the uh, renewable one. And we tried to do a real stock taking, a bottom up analysis country by country. We will also explain to you in this webinar how we did this analysis uh, and what is the methodology that we used. And uh, this is exercise uh, is basically covering uh, almost all countries in the world uh, and 99% uh, of the uh, emissions. Uh, and uh, this is quite a comprehensive analysis and data analyzation that we put it uh, together. But before going into these uh, details, uh, I'd like to uh, mention initially, uh, we looked at the NDCs. Uh, there are 194 of them. And uh, in these 94, 194 NDCs, uh, obviously renewables uh, are mentioned as a mitigation uh, technology and option in many of them. 
Uh, this is actually a quite good news that countries uh, uh, take it very seriously and, and think about renewables as an option, and they mention it in their NDCs. And uh, we also looked at how many NDCs quantified the renewables. Uh, almost uh, uh, half of them uh, are quantifying uh, renewables as a as a, some kind of a uh, either share capacity additions and so on and so forth. And this is also a good news that the countries not only mention renewables, but also uh, talk about them in quantitative terms. And next, we looked at how many NDCs explicitly mentioned renewable capacity for 2030. Obviously, here, uh, there is only uh, 14 countries that we found uh, that is explicitly matching this target. This is obviously normal because when those NDCs were written, uh, there was no uh, pledge on tripling renewables uh, at the time. But however, this shows also that many countries think about renewables and quantify renewables. So there's a good opportunity uh, to basically include those uh, renewable specific uh, goals and targets into the uh, NDCs. And we actually looked at uh, a lot of the uh, policies in addition to the uh, to what we see in the NDCs. Uh, but when we look at only NDCs, including uh, countries mentioned either technology or total renewable capacity targets, today uh, we have about 1,600 gigawatts of uh, renewables uh, mentioned in the NDCs. And obviously, uh, China uh, represents the significant majority of this with its solar PV and wind target, which is 1,200 gigawatts by 2030. Uh, it basically makes it the entire thing. And when we look at the Beyond NDCs, all the countries' um, uh, plans or ambitions or targets that they mentioned in their uh, uh, official documents, which uh, this exercise did, uh, we see significantly more than what NDCs have. That's why we are very optimistic that uh, countries already have uh, 8,000 gigawatts of uh, renewable capacity mentioned in their ambitions uh, that we were able to find. And this is actually a very good news, which means that uh, they are there, the countries think about them, and which gives an opportunity to also include them in the analysis. In this case, we see two different uh, trends uh, in the ambitions that the countries uh, put together. Uh, advanced economies and emerging and developing uh, countries, these are two different uh, types uh, that we look at uh, in this uh, slide. And in terms of advanced economies, the announced uh, ambitions uh, uh, expects uh, that their renewable capacity based uh, on 2020 installed uh, base will increase uh, by two times or 1.9 times to be more specific. And for emerging and developing, where mostly they are in the nascent stage of deploying renewables in most cases, uh, their ambitions are uh, much higher, around 2.5 times. And obviously, uh, this 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 it reaches only 70% of the 11,000 or the tripling goal that uh, the governments agreed. Uh, and uh, this expects uh, uh, advanced economies to more than double, actually 20 half times their uh, 2022 baseline. And for uh, emerging and developing economies, this will be 3.5 times almost. So uh, two different trends uh, and uh, two different expectations here uh, to reach the, to, to close the ambition gap. Uh, when we look at the, uh, uh, the the way that the gap is structured and how we did the analysis, I would like to uh, turn uh, the attention to my colleague Laura, who will explain before we go into the regional goals, how we did the analysis actually, how we collected the data. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amy. Yes, indeed, before we enter into analyzing numbers, we wanted to explain to you briefly how we came up with them and the methodology that we used. First, it is important to note that this is not modeling. This is a data collection exercise from official government sources. We used a bottom-up approach and analyzed 150 countries and territories to get to the total. We went through these 150 and we found that renewable ambition can be expressed in multiple ways. Uh, first, we found that ambition can be set for renewable generation or capacity, as you see in the screen. And then we have what we call the metric, which is how to measure that. We can have this in absolute value. We can find a share of a total, or we can find additions over a certain time period. On top of this, ambition can be set for total renewables, 
for a single technology, such as solar PV or onshore wind, or for a group of them, such as BRE or non-hydro resources. For instance, a country can aim for 50 gigawatts installed capacity by 2030, this is capacity absolute, or 80% renewable power mix, or adding 20 gigawatts of solar from now to uh, 2030. In total, we identified 1,000 ambition in any combination of these focus, metric, and technology. As you can see in the chart, half of them are absolute capacity. And then we have more or less the same share for generation share, for generation in absolute values, and for capacity additions. The COP28 pledge is expressed in terms of total renewable capacity installed by 2030. This is the famous uh, 11,000 gigawatts. Therefore, to assess how far or close we are from that, all ambitions need to be unified and expressed in those terms to be able to come up with a global number and to track the progress towards this pledge. This is, again, total renewables, capacity, absolute value, and values by 2030. And with this, we go on to the next slide. We go country by country, and we start unifying and translating all this ambition to these terms. First, some countries have ambitions already in terms of total renewable capacity installed by 2030. So we would take that this is the same terms as the COP28 pledge. Then some countries also have capacity goals, but only for center technologies. In these cases, we will build the total, um, adding up all the technologies. Then on one hand, we have those technologies that have an installed capacity ambition for 2030. We would take that. And then for those other technologies that don't have any ambition uh, set, we would take the capacity that is currently installed and there is no formal ambition to increase or change that number by 2030. An example of this, a country uh, says that has um, an ambition of 10 gigawatts of wind by 2030. Then we would take that number to 2030. And then we could see that this country has hydropower installed currently, but is not given any quantitative ambition for this technology. Then we would assume that in 2030, they have the same hydropower, no more, no less than what is there now. Let's say there is no official ambition to increase or change that value. Regarding that uh, currently or now, we are using 2022 as a baseline, as this is the year just before COP28, and the starting point of the discussion that was held that year over this tripling pledge. Then we move on and we go to those countries that don't have capacity ambition, but that have other types of ambition as we just saw before. For example, all the generation share ambitions are included here. In those cases, we would estimate what that share in generation would mean in terms of capacity. It's also in this uh, category, the countries that have uh, ambition for capacity additions. So for example, if a country wants to add, let's say 20 gigawatts of solar PV, this would be in this category because this is not the final point in 2030, but the pathway to it. So it's kind of a um, calculation and we need to do some work on that number, uh, basically put it on top of a baseline. You will see that this section is the biggest of the, of the chart. Uh, but I would like to know that half of this corresponds to China and uh, Jaime will touch upon this uh, later and more in detail. And last, we have a set of countries that don't have any official renewable ambition to 2030. For them, following the approach I mentioned before, we assume that the 2030 capacity would be the same as in the baseline, so 2022, because there is no formal mention to any ambition or intention to change this number in any way. And then with all of these categories and these 150 countries, we come up to our almost uh, 8,000 year awards global ambition. Thank you, Amy, back to you. Now uh, we are turning into the uh, regional uh, distribution of the uh, of the analysis of the 8,000 gigawatts that uh, we basically uh, discussed in previous slides. Uh, and here, obviously, uh, China uh, makes up uh, for the majority uh, of this, uh, of the, uh, of this 8,000 that, that we discussed. Um, China has official uh, target of reaching 1,200 gigawatts of solar PV and wind by 2030. It's actually not only in their uh, energy plan, but also in their NDC. Uh, however, uh, China uh, will reach its target in the coming months uh, for solar PV and uh, wind that they announced two years ago. 
um, and obviously uh, six years ahead of this of reaching their target means that they will uh, continue uh, building these technologies. Plus, uh, their target also includes uh, doesn't include any other renewable technologies except wind and solar PV. Uh, we can we can say that China has a huge hydropower installed capacity today, and it has uh, further plans to uh, install more. In that sense, we basically looked at uh, several modeling results from uh, from the uh, various uh, sources in China uh, that is connected to the uh, to the government research institutes, and then uh, we basically uh, are estimating around 3,200 gigawatts of uh, China's uh, pledge from various uh, variables that are uh, mentioned in various official uh, documents. Um, and beyond that, obviously, the second uh, uh, largest uh, um, region that is expecting uh, to, to have this ambition is Europe, uh, mostly uh, within the European Union countries. My colleague uh, Yasmina will go uh, more in detail on that one. Uh, the third one is Asia-Pacific uh, uh, region, which includes, obviously, India, uh, which is uh, one of the largest uh, renewable ambition that we see in terms of country levels, uh, followed by uh, United States uh, and Canada. Uh, however, there are also big ambitions from a, a small base uh, from other regions, which are currently a very small installed capacity, but they will grow uh, much faster in the future, uh, such as Middle East and North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and Eurasia. And uh, uh, we, we basically expect uh, different countries have different ambitions and they have different starting points uh, in the first place. Some of them has large hydro, some of them have no hydro, so they will only install uh, solar PV and wind and, and move forward with that. Um, in addition, uh, obviously, when we look at uh, all this idea of global uh, tripling pledge, we went into more detail who actually uh, wants to, based on their ambitions, uh, double, triple or more than triple their uh, renewable capacity. Uh, and we wanted to show you this chart that uh, only 11 countries, for instance, have no ambition, uh, which is a good news. Uh, it's a significant minority in this case. Uh, the uh, majority of the countries, uh, based on these intervals, uh, 73 of them expects to grow renewables from one to two uh, times uh, their installed capacity. Uh, however, the largest group that we see uh, is uh, between two to three times uh, growth, uh, uh, especially China is within this category. Uh, even though this is less countries, uh, 28 of them, uh, we expect them to contribute largest to this 8,000 uh, gigawatt growth. Obviously, there are also a lot of countries who want to grow uh, greater than uh, three times, which means 35 of them. However, these are uh, very small additions uh, compared to their uh, baseline, so they only account for a minority of the 8,000 gigawatts that we collected. Uh, there are already three of them exceeded their own ambition, uh, uh, which is a good news. So we hope uh, these three countries to increase their ambitions as quickly as possible. As Paula mentioned, we also looked at uh, in detail uh, the tracking of who is on track to reach their own ambitions. We mentioned that in the beginning that we are far from 11,000 with the 8,000 gigawatts that we collected. But uh, what about whether the countries are on track to reach their own uh, goals or ambitions that they mentioned? And in this case, uh, we use the last year's uh, capacity uh, additions uh, uh, as an indicator. And we saw that some countries are going faster. Uh, and they are on track. Actually, nearly 50 countries are on track to reach or surpass their current plans, which means about one third of all countries that we looked at. Uh, and uh, at the head of this is obviously China. China's deployment pace in 2023 was about 350 gigawatts in single year, uh, which is quite impressive. 75% uh, uh, of this came from solar PV alone. And China needs only to install 250 gigawatts to reach its own target. This tells us two stories. First of all, countries are going faster, uh, especially the largest renewable uh, market is going faster than uh, their own uh, ambitions, uh, which means it gives a lot of room to, to have uh, uh, a bit more uh, capacity in the next round of uh, goals that will be uh, set. Uh, there are also other countries who basically uh, have done a lot of very good work in terms of increasing the pace of installation, such as in Europe. 
They need to go faster, but not that faster. Actually, they are quite close with the current few uh, years pace of increase that they achieved in terms of renewable capacity additions. These markets need to improve, especially in terms of permitting and grid integration as key challenges. We will touch upon those uh, later in the, in the presentation. But when we look at the emerging uh, uh, and developing markets, um, except Latin America, who has a, a relatively small ambition due to the higher power, which my colleagues will touch upon later, uh, the others uh, need to accelerate much further in order to reach their own targets. So on the good side of the things, 50 countries are on track to reach their targets, but a hundred of them needs to do more, especially on the emerging and uh, emerging markets and the other economies addressing policy uncertainties and risking uh, financing. Uh, we also uh, analyzed uh, the, these trends by technology. Um, obviously, this was a bit challenging, uh, and uh, my colleague Yasmina will explain this to you why it was uh, challenging, because the ambitions are mentioned in multiple ways, as, as, as Laura uh, pointed out. Uh, but let's look at the technology uh, breakdown with Yasmina. Thank you, Amy. As Amy said, uh, when we want to look at the ambition broken down by technology, it gets a bit tricky. And the reason for that is that countries announce specific ambitions by technology for only 3,000 gigawatts. So that's only one third of the global ambition was explicitly identified and announced for capacity by technology for just 3,000 gigawatts. But the good news is that we were able to estimate the split uh, of capacity by technology for another 35%. And we were able to do that uh, two ways. Um, both of them, Laura uh, explained earlier. The first was to estimate the missing technologies. So as she mentioned, many countries set capacity ambitions for PV and for wind, but overlooked the existing fleet for dispatchable technologies that they already had operating. So hydropower, geothermal, bioenergy, CSV, and ocean. We assume that what's installed now will be installed in 2030. The second way we were able to estimate the breakdown was by using other metrics that countries use to announce their ambitions. Laura mentioned uh, some countries announced the share of renewables and power generation in Egypt or the uh, amount of additional projects that would be coming online in sub-Saharan Africa. So we were able to back calculate out uh, specific technologies there. But even after that, there was still about 27% of the ambition that we were not able to assign to a specific technology. And that's because when the governments announced this ambition, there was no indication that was given about what specific technology uh, that would be. And so when you add all of these up, we do arrive um, at the 8,000 gigawatt uh, ambition mark, of which about half of that um, is identified to be solar PV and wind. Um, and by 2030, we see that solar PV um, is identified uh, as the most sought after technology, so it would surpass hydropower. However, these values could change depending on how that 27% of non-specified actually plays out. Um, so that's really going to depend on the policies that governments set to get there or how the market conditions are at that point in time. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Yasmina. Uh, please keep your camera on because the next slide is yours, but I'll let say a few words before we go into the regional uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, from now on in the presentation, you will see different regional trends. Uh, I just want to specify that uh, these are the uh, bottom-up uh, adding up of the countries that we collected. We are not presenting here any official regional uh, targets or goals. These are all the country-level analysis. I just wanted to highlight that. And obviously, different regions have different uh, ambitions, and how they set this is different. And we will start with uh, Europe. Uh, because uh, it's uh, especially European Union uh, really pushed hard uh, politically to achieve uh, the tripling uh, goal of the of the of the seven COP28, uh, and uh, we will start with that. Yasmina, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, as Hemi mentioned, Europe is the region that has the second highest uh, global ambition. By 2030, they aim to install 1,600 gigawatts, of which. Over half of that is located um, in the top four markets led by Germany, Spain, Italy, and France. Though I do want to point out that Europe is not synonymous with the EU. Um, Non-EU countries um, do account for almost 20% of Europe's ambition that's led by the UK, 
followed by Turkey and Norway. But as Hamie pointed out, a majority of this, about 80% um, of the ambition in Europe is coming um, from the EU. And when you add up all of those countries' plans, you get to about 1,300 gigawatts, um, Hamie, if you will, um, which come from uh, the country's national energy and climate plans. Now, these NECPs are uh, required submissions or proposals um, of what countries plan to achieve uh, to reach their shares of contribution to the EU target of 42.5% of renewable energy by 2030. And that 2030 goal is an intermediate goal for a longer term 2050 goal of having climate neutrality. Now, the good news is this 1200 or 1300 gigawatts is actually 5% higher than what the commission envisioned in their Repower EU plan for 2030. This plan was set out in 2022 to accelerate renewable capacity in order to decrease uh, the dependency on imported gas after uh, Ukraine's invasion. However, there are two signs that indicate uh, that ambition might need to be higher. And the first is that when you add up the member states' ambition by technology, you can see that member states plan on overshooting what the commission envisions for 2030 for solar PV, but undershoots what the commission envisions for wind. The second thing is that when you look at this renewable capacity for the member states' ambition, it corresponds to proposals that don't quite meet the 42.5% EU target by 2030. Therefore, we can expect perhaps some higher ambition or this picture to change slightly um, in the coming months as countries decide whether or not they're going to use more renewable electricity to decarbonize uh, mobility and uh, heat. Thank you very much, uh, Yasmina. Uh, now I would like to turn your attention to Asia uh, Pacific region, uh, which is uh, obviously quite large. There are a lot of economies who are emerging and developing in the region with high demand growth and uh, lots of important uh, uh, renewable energy policies announced uh, recently uh, and lots of challenges as well. Uh, Piotr will uh, summarize the, the trends that we see in the region. Yes, thank you, Jamie. Well, in Asia Pacific, government plans uh, indicate doubling of renewable capacity by 2030, reaching 1,200 gigawatts. This amounts to roughly 15% of global ambition, uh, third among all regions. Uh, the indisputable leader uh, is India, which accounts for almost half of planned growth. Uh, India is aiming to achieve almost 490 gigawatts of renewables by 2030 with 60% share of solar PV. Reaching this goal would increase installed capacity by a factor of 260 compared with 2022. And India is really very actively pursuing this goal by continuously introducing new separate policies and uh, growing its renewable market from one year to another. Uh, the second strongest ambition comes from Japan at about 200 gigawatts, followed by Australia with close to 100. Uh, however, the average annual capacity growth resulting from these plans is a bit smaller than in previous five years. The reason is that Australia and Japan already have a lot of renewables uh, installed, mostly in PV, and their short to medium term, term focus uh, has been switched to system integration and other renewable technologies, which require less capacity for the same amount of generation. Uh, ASEAN ambitions total about 230 gigawatts, double of capacity from 2022. The leader uh, in this uh, association of countries is Vietnam uh, with over 80 gigawatts plan, followed by Indonesia and Philippines. Uh, however, se several countries of the region currently have low share of variable renewable energy in their generation, below 5%. Uh, however, their ambitions are often uh, limited. Uh, it is potentially putting them at risk of missing on many economic and uh, environmental benefits of cheap PV and wind power, uh, which is easy to deploy at uh, such low VRE shares. Uh, regarding technologies, I mean, if you might, uh, thanks. Uh, solar PV is the leading, of course, in the region with 60% share in plant additions. Uh, this is obviously the first choice technology in most countries due to low cost and uh, easy deployment. Uh, PV is followed by wind with over 25% share in additions. However, Achieving this goal would require quadrupling of average annual deployment compared to the previous five years, 
which might be challenging, taking into account often limited suitable space in many regions' countries. Uh, offshore wind could be a solution, however, it is still considered to be too expensive in most countries. If only Japan, Vietnam, and Chinese Taipei explicitly mentioning its deployment by 2030. For the remaining technologies, amb ambitions are more limited, with only India and Vietnam planning uh, large hydropower additions. Thanks, back to him. Uh, thank you, Piotr. Uh, now we are moving into Latin America uh, and Caribbean. Uh, we see the region has an uh, important particularity related to already high share of renewables and the role of hydropower. Uh, and Laura uh, will summarize the regional uh, trend uh, uh, in a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, we'll start with a bit of context. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean accounted for less than 3% of global GAG emissions from power generation and heat in 2022. The contrary ambitions of the region show that overall, Latin America and the Caribbean aim to increase its total renewable capacity by 39% or 1.39, reaching almost uh, 450 gigawatts in 2030. The power mix of the region, as uh, Jaime and Jasmina has been mentioning already, it uh, relies a lot on, on hydro and has over 60% generation coming from the source. This is the highest percentage of all the regions globally, of all the regions that we are talking about now. As you can see in the chart, hydropower is the primary source of generation for 10 countries in the region, and it means more than half of the electricity production in most of them. Due to these already high values of renewable installed, the growth factors regarding ambition to 2030 are typically between one and two, as you can see uh, in the chart now. Um, and this is because there is a lot of renewable capacity already installed, and it has disappeared when we are talking in ambition in relative terms. Uh, hey, me, if you may. Yes. Um, yeah, there you can see that the ambition for most countries is, as I mentioned, in between one and, and two. Uh, regarding other technologies, uh, Brazil and Chile together aim to install 47 gigawatts of solar PV and wind combined by 2030. This is roughly 40% of the capacity that needs to be installed to meet the region's goal. From a geographical perspective, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, and Mexico account for nearly 80% of the regional ambition. Among these, Brazil represents half of the region, and Chile has one of the highest ambitions with a growth factor of 2.5, as you can see in the charts. And last but not least, we analyze the Caribbean, one of the most affected regions by climate change and its consequences. Over there, we found that all countries mentioned renewables in their NDCs, and nine set quantitative targets to renewables. The Caribbean is more ambitious than the average of the region and is aiming to more than double the renewable capacity by 2030. Can you hear me? Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, uh, for this quick summary. Uh, now uh, I would like to turn to United States and Canada, uh, important uh, renewable energy warehouses uh, in the world today, and uh, uh, Trevor will explain us where they are expected uh, to go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Hamy. Um, like Laura provided, I'm going to provide some context here. The United States and Canada account for 12% of greenhouse gas emissions from power and heat production. Now, the U.S. and Canada have a combined ambition of nearly 1,000 gigawatts of total renewable capacity in 2030, and both countries have ambitions to decarbonize their electric sectors. Now, the U.S. is targeting a carbon-free electric sector by 2035, as outlined in their nationally determined contribution, and generates over 60% of their electricity from fossil fuels today. Canada's emissions reduction plan discusses having a 90, not having 90% of power generation from non-emitting resources by 2030, with the country currently deriving the majority of their power generation from non-emitting resources, such as hydropower and nuclear. Now, in both countries, hydropower plays an important role in renewable generation, with hydropower being the largest source of renewable generation in Canada and second largest renewable resource of generation in the United States. However, both markets may see only a modest expansion of hydropower throughout the end of the decade, which would indicate an expansion of solar PV and wind power capacity to reach that 2030 ambition. 
Now, in the U.S., driving this new capacity will be the federal tax incentives for investment and production provided by the Inflation, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, while state programs for distributed renewable resources will also be a driver. In Canada, the recent investment tax credit for clean energy technologies, coupled with provincial level auctions and tenders, will enable new, renew, new capacity. Now, overall, the nearly 1,000 gigawatts of renewable capacity by 2030 represents almost 13% of total global ambition, indicating that these markets will play a significant role in the expansion of renewable capacity through the end of the decade. Amy? Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, we are turning to Middle East and North Africa, uh, and uh, obviously there has been uh, uh, incredible announcements of very large renewable energy projects in the region. Uh, and uh, the question is, are they reflected in their goals? Yes, Mina, that's uh, for example. Thank you, Amy. So the Middle East and North Africa has the world's smallest renewable capacity base currently installed in 2022. It's, it's just under 50 gigawatts, with about a third of that being in countries that have to import fossil fuels in order to meet their power demands, such as Morocco and Lebanon and the UAE. Another two thirds is located in countries that produce enough fossil fuels to meet their own domestic uh, power demands, so they're self-sufficient. But they have high ambitions. And by 2030, the region aims to install, if you will, about 200 gigawatts. So that's quite a significant increase. It's a growth factor of 4.5 times what's currently installed now. And that's the highest growth factor uh, in the world. And what's interesting to note is that about 80% of the region's ambition is actually coming from countries that are self-sufficient with their own fossil fuel production. So about a quarter of that is led uh, um, solely by Saudi Arabia, followed by Egypt and Algeria uh, and Israel. But it's really notable to note how much fossil fuel producers are accounting for uh, most of the region's uh, ambition. And the reason for that is the improving cost competitiveness um, of solar PV against domestically produced fossil fuels for power generation. Uh, Amy, if you will, we've seen solar PV bid prices from competitive auctions drop 75% over the last 10 years, from about $68 a megawatt hour in Jordan in 2015, down to around 14 uh, this year in the UAE. Um, there's several reasons for these cost declines. First, equipment costs have fallen over the same time period. Um, also, the increasing use of competitive auctions which caused developers to bid quite aggressively. Um, projects also have been getting larger and larger, so developers can take advantage of economies of scale for cost efficiencies. But the prices are low simply also because they've got really good solar resources in the region, as well as access to very beneficial land costs and financing. And so because of this, solar PV plays a very big role in the Middle East North Africa's uh, capacity emissions for 2030, it accounts for about half. Thank you. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, sorry for the, I remain muted. Uh, uh, now we are moving to Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which basically has uh, an important uh, uh, plans, uh, great potential, but very little uh, deployment today. Uh, and let's see if they are reflected, this potential is reflected in their, in their goals. Yeah, Hamy, when we talk about ambition, we can really look to Sub-Saharan Africa, where countries' combined ambition will over triple renewable energy capacity. Now, country-wise, Nigeria, South Africa, and Ethiopia lead the way, accounting for nearly 60% of the total regional aims. Now, Ethiopia relies on hydropower for expansion, while Nigeria has a mix of hydropower, solar PV, and wind power. South Africa also relies on solar PV and wind power to meet their 2030 ambition, which will be uh, aimed to be met via auctions and private investment. 
Now, speaking of wind and solar power, the total combined capacities of these technologies would almost quadruple should this ambition be met and underlying the increasingly important role solar PV and wind have in re renewable expansion within the region. But it's also important to note that hydropower is still a major factor, which with capacity more than doubling. Now, in addition, Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the only regions uh, globally with ambition to add CSP and geothermal capacity as well. There are two additional factors that drive uh, regional ambition beyond the expansion of utility scale renewables. The first is increased electrification or access, and the second being fuel switching. 18 countries mention access and electrification as part of their 2030 ambition, while eight countries aim to replace heavy fuel oil generators, such as diesel, with renewable resources by the end of the decade. Now, finally, many countries have both unconditional and conditional ambition, with additional financing being required for conditional ambition uh, for certain countries to achieve 2030 aims. In fact, six countries, Angola, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Gabon, Rwanda, and Senegal would see 70% higher ambition should additional financing be made available, like the 100 billion uh, per year pledged by advanced economies for climate financing. Now, while there are numerous factors that will enable Sub-Saharan Africa's over 165 gigawatts of renewable capacity in 2030, the overall ambition is well-balanced, tapping resource availability to increase total capacity while also achieving higher access rates. Amy? Thank you very much, uh, Trevor, for this. Uh, uh, now, uh, the last region which is usually forgotten in terms of uh, their potential is Eurasia. They actually have a lot of potential for every single uh, renewable technology, but uh, uh, they were a bit lost in the translation over the last uh, decade in terms of renewables. And uh, Kartik will give us a quick summary of the, of the region. Thank you, Hemi. Uh, Eurasia is responsible for 7% of global GHG emissions from power generation and heat production. Currently, the region's share of renewable energy source in electricity generation is only 20%, with hydropower accounting for most of it. Based on the NDC's multilateral and national plans, Eurasia's renewable capacity ambition for 2030 is to increase renewable capacity by 1.3 times, raising it to one more than just more than 120 gigawatt which represents merely 1.5% of global renewable capacity ambition. Only two countries, uh, Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan, have explicit goals for total renewable capacity by 2030 in their respective NDCs. Even though hydropower remains the region's dominant renewable energy technology, most countries in this region have announced plans to expand their wind and solar PV capacity to benefit from their huge untapped potential. In fact, Eurasian countries aspire to almost triple their wind and solar PV capacity from current 9 gigawatt to 25 gigawatt by 2030. Uzbekistan's ambition of 8 gigawatt of wind and PV is the largest by 2030, while the energy community countries together account for around 33%. At COP28, Russia announced that it would double its renewable capacity from the current 6 gigawatt to 12 gigawatt by 2030. Therefore, Russia's non-hydro renewable am ambition indicates only a 10% increase to its renewable capacity and skews the region's overall ambition. Uh, overall, Eurasian uh, countries remain very reliant on fossil fuels, which account for almost two thirds of the region's electricity generation, raising current ambitions, uh, boosting efficiency and enlarging, and enlarging transmission and distribution networks can help the region accelerate clean energy transitions, uh, improve energy security, at the same time reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Back to you, Hemi. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kartik. Uh, the book was not only about numbers. Uh, we actually did uh, an exercise on the on the policies, uh, and uh, in order to uh, basically show uh, the world that how we can close the implementation uh, gap, uh, we try to do for the first time a clustering of countries based on their challenges. Uh, and uh, uh, we would like to present very quickly one example because the analysis is quite deep. Uh, I highly recommend you to take a look at the chapter two of the document where we actually give a lot of detail about uh, uh, possible policy options. 
But uh, to summarize uh, the results, I would like to turn to uh, Vasily uh, for the uh, for the policy section. Thank you very much, Amy. Exactly. Uh, as you mentioned, um, we looked at the, at the challenges, clustering them along um, um, the, the countries. So um, basically, we started with um, the cluster one that uh, comprises most advanced economies that have ambitious net zero plans and which are targeting a full power sector decarbonization in the next decade. The main challenges we identified for in this cluster are lengthy permitting, procedures that hamper or delay renewable energy deployment, then um, a lack of visibility of the auction schedule and the design, um, lack of investment in grid infrastructure, flexibility needs to increase of the power system, and last but not least, repowering um, of aging renewable energy plants, especially um, hydropower and wind power. The next cluster we identified comprises um, a lot of um, emerging economies, um, that actually have already quite a considerable and high share of hydropower and that are actually um, um, rapidly increasing their renewable energy capacity currently. What we identified there were, um, on the one hand, um, elevated financing costs that hampered a further renewable energy um, deployment. And on the other hand, especially on the sub-national level, um, several issues with system integration, for instance, due to a lack of investment into the grid infrastructure. Coming to the third cluster, um, those are again um, emerging economies um, that have actually quite ambitious long-term decarbonization goals and ambitions, yeah. Um, but at the same time, currently um, show a high fossil fuel overcapacity. Um, one challenge in this cluster are locked in and a young fossil um, fuel-based um, uh, power fleet, power, um, power plant fleet that actually um, hampers the, um, um, the deployment of renewables because utilities have issues um, of displacing this fossil fuels with renewables. And a perceived high renewable energy costs in these, um, in these countries further, um, um, further makes it more difficult to actually displace those uh, fossil fuels. Coming to the last cluster, cluster four, um, these comprises actually um, most developing economies that have nascent renewable energy markets, yet quite a high potential for renewable energy deployment and quite strong ambitions. There we mostly see um, that in a lack of investment in the grid infrastructure, thus a weak grid, as well as quite high financing costs and, and a higher risk for investors, um, hampers the further renewable energy deployment. Nevertheless, um, we didn't just stop at identifying the challenges, but we actually looked into policy priorities that countries can consider to focus on, and we provided several examples for policy actions. Um, and I would like to show you out of these 11 um, challenges we identified and 35 policy priorities in total, I wanted to focus um, today on the um, lack of visibility of the auction schedule and um, the auction design, especially in cluster one, that is currently not fit for the macroeconomic developments. So um, on the one hand, the first policy priority we identified is um, um, to, uh, for countries to consider um, providing a long-term auction schedule. So the first policy activity is like to announce a regular schedule, auction schedule that is tailored, of course, to the ambitions of each country. And in the best case, provide capacities for each of the auctions for a um, long, uh, longer time frame to strengthen investor confidence and to, um, uh, to incentivize um, in, uh, investment into the local supply chain. And all these auction schedules should actually take into account PBA activity. The next policy priority uh, we identified um, was that auctions should be adapted to the new macroeconomic environment. What can countries actually do? They could, because at the, um, at the past years, we've seen um, higher high, uh, interest rates, as well as elevated costs for um, the many of the, um, of the components. So countries can actually um, set an appropriate ceiling price in the auctions to attract enough bidders. At the same time, countries should actually balance the um, increasing the incentive for renewable um, um, renewable uh, energy 
but at the same time looking at the expenses of households and taxpayers. Then the third policy activity could be to um, actually index the um, contracts for renewable energy generators to include inflation or other elevated prices for the main components. And last but not least, um, governments could consider monitoring um, the realization of already awarded renewable energy projects. So if there is any issue in the realization of those to actually add, um, act on that or include this in the future auction warnings. So thank you very much. Back to you, Helen. Thank you, uh, Vasily, for a quick summary. Uh, now uh, we would like to finish the, the presentation. There are already uh, some questions in the in the list, which I will uh, start. Uh, but uh, one important news that uh, this tremendous work uh, uh, is done by uh, a lot of people. Some of them are presented here. Some of them uh, were behind the scenes. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for their contribution. And uh, this data is actually available online. That's actually the, the most important news that I can share. Uh, it's not in the report, but we have a website that we show for most of the countries uh, uh, the data of 2030 ambition, uh, and we compare the trajectory based on our forecast that we published in January. Uh, we will be updating our forecast towards 2030 in October, uh, so that we have a, a very good benchmark uh, compared to the, uh, to the goals uh, that we have. Uh, uh, you can ask your questions in the Q&A box. We have uh, about 10 minutes to uh, answer these uh, these questions. We will try to go through them uh, as quickly uh, as possible. Otherwise, uh, uh, we may come back to you with uh, either a written answer or uh, uh, something uh, uh, that is relevant to your uh, multiple questions to, to a general answer uh, by email. Um, so uh, one question uh, related to this uh, uh, was related to uh, have you looked into the system requirements to host these capacity increase in the electric system, particularly grid uh, expansion? Uh, I think uh, we can uh, start with that. Uh, let me start uh, very quickly uh, on this topic. Um, obviously, grid uh, remains an important uh, bottleneck uh, in the deployment of, uh, of renewables uh, globally. Uh, Wind and solar especially has uh, uh, can be deployed uh, much faster than uh, how grid uh, can develop. It takes much longer for the grid. It requires way long-term uh, planning that uh, uh, compared to the wind and solar PV. And in our previous analysis, we actually uh, identified that there are a lot of uh, renewable energy projects that would like to connect to the grid, apply to the grid, but actually cannot because of the lack of infrastructure. Uh, we estimated that there were about 1,500 advanced stage projects. Uh, we, are, we did not include those that are uh, uh, not serious projects, only at the very early planning stage, but only the advanced projects were 1,500 gigawatts based on our analysis last year, uh, which means that three times uh, uh, basically the annual additions uh, that the world deployed last year. So this tells you very quickly how grid uh, remains an uh, important uh, bottleneck, especially uh, in advanced economies where uh, there is an important uh, uh, issue in terms of the saturation of the grid and the uh, grid network is quite old uh, in terms of the deployment. Uh, Paolo, do you want to add anything uh, on this? No, not a decision. Okay. So, um, uh, another uh, question, uh, uh, how can ambitions of these European countries be compared with those of uh, uh, Russia? Um, I think uh, compared to Europe versus Russia is a huge difference in terms of renewable ambition. Europe is way more ambitious, as my uh, colleague Kartik uh, mentioned. Um, uh, it is quite uh, different in terms of the level. Uh, actually, uh, actually, in this case, I think 50 times more than what Russia expects Europe is uh, is aiming to install. So it's quite uh, different uh, in terms of the growth. Um, uh, another question was related to the uh, how can the ambitions of this Europe? Sorry, China does not have change of policies with the change of governments. Uh, it's a very good question, uh, but uh, China uh, sets basically the important ambitions every five years in their national plans uh, for all the economy sector, not only for energy or renewable energy. And in these uh, basically uh, structure, 
Uh, they announce every uh, five years a new goal, which is also sometimes included in their uh, NDCs for the for the climate change discussions. So, and then they usually overachieve uh, these targets by far. They did this in their 13th uh, five-year plan, 12th five-year plan, and 14th five-year plan in the next months, probably six years ahead. So, in that sense, uh, China is usually announce unambitious target, and their renewable energy market goes much faster. Uh, than this. Um, so uh, another one is the uh, related to the uh, Ember's analysis, uh, saying that uh, uh, our tracking of 2030 renewables targets at Ember shows only two countries have updated their electricity targets since COP20 announcement last December: uh, Poland and Bulgaria. What time are you hoping countries to update their electricity plans and NDCs? This is a great question. Uh, thank you, Dave, for this. Um, so um, we presented uh, this report uh, a few weeks ago in the uh, intersessional meeting in Vienna you know, C. Uh, not only those uh, tracking related to renewables, but all. So uh, our message was very clear. There is a great opportunity here to include uh, uh, sector-specific targets into the NDCs. And uh, there's room for that. Actually, there's room for more ambitious targets to be announced. Um, and um, we expect countries to move ahead. Initially, uh, all the European Union countries will update, will submit their final uh, NECPs in the coming months. I think that will be uh, an important step for the uh, bunch of countries that will update their, uh, their ambitions. Uh, but also, there's a lot of discussion right now that is started uh, in China. Uh, and in various other large markets to increase their uh, ambition as they already achieved uh, the, their ambition today. So I expect a lot of move uh, uh, going forward in the coming six months that more and more countries beyond uh, 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 your analysis, Bulgaria and Poland will, will actually increase their uh, ambitions. Uh, we have another uh, Questions, Paul. Let me know if you want to uh, jump in. I don't see the question, so it's a yeah. No. So uh, there's another question. Uh, it's a very long one to read, actually. So uh, I will basically focus on the another one, and I will go back to it. Uh, Hydrogen Europe is already working on these complementaries and will be very keen to share our findings. There, thank you for the attention. Okay, it's related to hydrogen and how hydrogen will enable uh, uh, basically providing flexibility and storage. Uh, so uh, they are expecting IEA to include more hydrogen discussion in this uh, goals. Maybe Paolo, you want to? Yeah, maybe I comment on that. Yeah. Uh, we, this is not the objective of uh, this study, but in, in our usual market report that we will uh, update in uh, at the end of October anyway, before the COP, we also track the dedicated renewable power capacities for hydrogen. And in our more general global hydrogen review of that the IEA Secretariat does, we update all the, the situation of the uh, hydrogen plants. What you say in terms of hydrogen potentially providing additional flexibility is definitely true but will happen more in the longer term. Unfortunately, the situation as it is now is that only 7% of the project pipelines of hydrogen have reached a final investment decision. Most of the reason for that is policy uh, focusing more on supply rather than demand. So there has not been enough creation of demand I have to say, however, that in very recent times now, there are auction systems uh, coming uh, in, for instance, in Germany, but in other parts of the world just now, and Japan is announcing the same, and this should really create um, a market for hydrogen. Having said so, uh, I think, uh, we think that the, we observe that the first um, applications for hydrogen will be more in industry to substitute hydrogen, which is today produced from fossil fuels, and only in the longer term it will then go to other applications, including having power, uh, providing additional power system flexibility to the power system, which is definitely 
a long-term potential benefit. But in the meantime, other system flexibility sources like demand side, uh, storage, including batteries, pumped hydro, and of course grids will do the job. Thank you very much, Paolo. Uh, I think we answered most of the questions. Uh, we don't want to take uh, more of your time. It's four o'clock uh, in Paris. Uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, for your participation and to all my colleagues who uh, conducted uh, and uh, contributed to the research. And uh, I wish you uh, a good rest of the day, wherever uh, you are. Uh, thank you very much and uh, looking forward to see you again in our uh, next webinar. Thanks to you, Hemi, yeah. and thanks to the whole team and thanks everybody who attended. We are uh, happy also to um, answer uh, written uh, questions. Thank you.